Okay, good morning. So let, let's, let's begin. So Donk and I would like to welcome you all to this workshop on stress and meter, honoring our, our teacher and colleague, Morris Halley, on the occasion of his 90th birthday. We want to begin by acknowledging all the help we have received in the funding, planning, and staging of this event. We are very grateful to the generous support of Deborah Fitzgerald, our dean in the School of Humanities, Arts, and Sciences. We want, first of all, to thank Mary Grenham. Is Mary here? Yeah, there she is at the top of the stairs. Um, for organizing all of the logistics and festivities that we have planned for this evening and tomorrow evening. We got a lot of help from our students who took time out from their busy schedules. So thanks to Micho Erlewine and Michelle Fullwood for constructing and managing the conference website and for the help in the details of photocopying, poster board setup, registration, and, and so on. We thank Eze Razin, Lila Major, Suyon Yoon, Milena Sisevich, Atulia Aravind, Ian Giblin, Anthony Brohan, Michelle Yoon, Kope Van Ork, Sam Steady, Benjamin Storm, Juliet Stanton, and Junya Nomura. I apologize in advance if I've left anyone's name out. Okay, so I'd like to begin by uh, making a few remarks about the content and form of our conference. The study of stress patterns at the word and sentence level has been at the center of linguistic research since the outset of the generative approach. No one has contributed more to this research endeavor than Morris, who is sitting there. <laughs> Our website lists some 21 articles and books on stress and 22 on poetic meter that Morris has penned over the course of his long career. The first of these was his 1956 paper with Noam Chomsky and Fred Lukoff on the cyclic structure of English phrasal stress. This paper, as we all know, marked a radical departure from earlier conceptions of phonology and showed the insights that to be gained from explicit rules operating on abstract representations. This approach laid the foundation for fundamental discoveries in the phonology of stress in the ensuing six decades. Our workshop brings together Morris, his students, and their students to discuss their latest findings in the central area of linguistic research. In these opening remarks, I want to touch briefly on some of the major questions that have arisen in this program of research on stress. Probably the most fundamental one is, what is stress? The sound pattern of English treated stress as a feature assigned by a rewrite rule. While this format permitted many descriptive generalizations to be uncovered, it also introduced major anomalies. The stress rules in SBA required disjunctive ordering to keep one rule from overriding the effects of another. More puzzling was that there are no rules of stress assimilation or spreading. A significant breakthrough in our understanding of stress was the 1975 thesis by Mark Lieberman, who proposed that stress reflects a syntagmatic relation of prominence among the syllables in a word that can be represented by the metrical grid. On this view, phonetic correlates of duration, pitch, and intensity foreground the peaks and valleys, and thus there is no feature to spread. An immediate question arises if we accept this proposal. How is the grid constructed? Early on, two divergent views emerge, and the question of which one is correct remains uh, unresolved. One sees the peaks and valleys of the grid as forming a grouping, much like the syntactic constituent built on a head complement asymmetry. Morris is one of the most foremost pro proponents of this view. In his work with Jean-Roger Vigneault and Billy Tsardi, he developed a simple and elegant system of parameterized rules that build up the grid by inserting grouping operators and designating one member of the group as the head, which then projects to the next level of a grid for another round of grouping and head marking. An alternative approach explored first by Alan Prince and Lisa Selkirk and more recently Matt Gordon and many others takes the peaks and valleys of the grid as the real objects of stress and formulates rules and constraints over of stress lapse and clash to control their distribution. Evidence for and against these competing conceptions of stress has not been abundant and a number of today's presentations and posters take up this question. 
It is interesting to note that a parallel question arises in alternative conceptions of syllabification as waves of sonority versus headed constituents. In a few languages like Arabic and Yupik Eskimo, rules deleting a stressed vowel seem to shift the stress to the vowel's sister syllable in a foot, so that in an iambic system like Yupik, stress shifts leftward, while in a trochaic system like Arabic, it shifts rightward. This phenomenon, if genuine, poses a challenge to the wave view, since all a stress peak should care about is being higher than its neighbors. And so it has no particular reason to shift to the left or to the right. The two-step process of stress placement and stress shift under deletion also poses a challenge to classical optimality theory, where there are no intermediate steps between the input and the output. This kind of phenomenon will be addressed to, later today by John McCarthy, Joe Pater, and Catherine Pruitt in their presentation. The, iamb the iambic trochaic law, first brought to our attention by Bruce Hayes, has been also been taken as support for the grouping hypothesis, since it claims an inherent connection between the phonology of the head and its sister constituent at the right or left edge of the foot. Megan Crowhurst will present some of recent experimental findings on this phenomenon. Stress is probably the most well-studied phonological property, with typological surveys covering well over 500 languages. We thus have a pretty good sense of its range of variation. Core properties are the prevalence of ryth rhythmic-like two-stage alternations with a preference for binary grouping of light, heavy, light, two light syllables or a single heavy. But ternary alternations and trisyllabic windows are very well established empirically. They pose the question of whether to expand the inventory of metrical constituents or can these supersized units be accommodated in some other way. This question will be addressed by Junko Ito and Armin, well, uh, Armin Mester, as well as some of our posters. The stress typologies tell us that stress patterns can be analyzed as a product of more elementary factors of directionality of parsing and head marking with symmetrical left-right options. Given this, it is no surprise that formal learning mod modeling has tended to focus on stress and some of the challenges posed by the hidden structure. Ellen Prince and Bill Itzardi will be exploring what elementary gradients of stress systems can tell us about linguistic computation and phonological theory more, more generally. Finally, uh, shortly after the publication of SPE, Morris began addressing the accent systems of the Slavic and Baltic languages and their relationship to Indo-European. In an early paper with Paul Kaparski, they showed that Lithuanian and common Slavic preserve, preserve the leftmost accent in a word containing more than one accent, and if the word had no underlying accents, then a default was placed on the initial syllable. In a later paper with Bill Itzardi, Morris argued that leftmost accent and leftmost default could be analyzed by a system placing left and right facing grouping operators in the appropriate positions in the representation. In their analysis, Slavic has the same abstract structure as Halcha Mongolian and other default to same side languages. A common evolutionary path in Baltic and Slavic is to initial stress, as in Czech, or from the Indo European perspective, Germanic. And the question arises then formally um, in, their, in their analysis simply from the loss of the lexical left brackets. Paul Kaparski's intriguing Missing Link uh, paper today will touch on Germanic and the source of the Scandinavian accents. In some today's lectures and posters promise us an exciting look into the phonology of stress. The conference is in workshop format, and so we've asked our speakers to limit their presentations to 30 minutes, allowing a full 15 minutes follow-up for question and answer. There will also be a general discussion section at the close of today's schedule where we can hopefully synthesize some of the individual presentations. 